So things are crazy right now. You know, I think we can all agree on that, right? I mean, it seems like that might be the only thing we can all agree on. Um, but we got that locked in. Yeah. Okay, good. So several months ago, I'm not sure when exactly, because you know, time doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, I know it was spring. <laughs> um, I ordered a pattern from Wearing History because I wanted to make this. Regardless of your political affiliation, I believe it's more important now than maybe ever before to make your voice heard, especially if you're like me, or at least like how I used to be. One of the folks who would sit in the back, hated politics, would quietly cast your vote. 100 years ago, the 19th Amendment was passed, which theoretically gave women the right to vote. Now when I say gave, that's not really the right word. The campaign for women's rights really began way back in the 1820s or 30s. Women worked and fought for nearly a hundred years in the United States to be able to cast a ballot. And when I say theoretically, I mean that when the 19th Amendment finally was passed, all women should have been free to exercise their right of citizenship to vote, but they weren't. Black, Asian, Indigenous, and other women of color were denied that right by Jim Crow laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, and intimidation. There's other things that happened, but it wasn't until the Voter Rights Act of 1965 that all women were legally able to vote. The voter suppression still happened then and still happens today. You're probably thinking, I thought this channel was about old clothes. It is. Hang on, because clothing often reflects history. In the 1890s, the fashionable ideal was this. And in the 1920s, the fashionable ideal was this. How did we get there? Now this is an oversimplification of clothing history, but in one word, the answer is war. World War I broke out in 1914 after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. It wasn't long before Russia, Belgium, France, Great Britain, Serbia, Austria-Hungary, and Germany were all at war. The United States at first adopted a policy of neutrality, but after a German submarine sunk U.S. commercial and passenger vessels, the U.S. threw its hat into the ring as well, and men needed to serve on the front were taken from their jobs. Women stepped into these roles, and not only were women working as nurses and in manufacturing, but they went to work on farms too. They did every possible job you could think of, and you can't be building bombs in your floor length skirt and puff sleeves. This is the pattern I'm making, and it's taken from a 1916 pattern. The style is typical for the late 1910s. These images are from the standard pattern catalog, winter of 1916-17, and were typical of the soft, utilitarian, and practical uh, suits that were worn at the time. These styles became tubular, and this is a trend that would continue to evolve into the 1920s. Like I said, my suit pattern is from 1916, but was something that I don't think would have looked out of place in 1920, the first year that women could vote in a presidential election. Because actually, the 20s aren't really what most of us imagine. We think of this. No, <clears throat> wrong. But they did look like this. And this. And this and this, and this. So now back to this lady and her suit. I don't know who she is, though her photo has been used widely, especially this year. For her message resounded with me. We fought for it, we won it for you, now use it. And so this suit is for all the women who have come before me to allow me to be able to vote, work, drive, speak in the public arena, and be seen as a whole person. Go on to the sewing. Hey guys, welcome to the sewing room. I'm Christine, the saucy seamstress, and today's video is a vlog. And um, the hope and plan is to have this done before election day, to spend a couple of days in 
on the week leading up to election day outside with my suit, with my sign, encouraging women to get out there and use their vote. So let me show you what I've got in preparation. So I want, first I'm going to show you the pattern, which is this one wearing history um, 1910s suit pattern. This is the E pattern that I printed at home. So the first part, the first task will be assembling the pattern and cutting out the pieces. I have bought two fabrics for this. This is looking very orange on the screen, but it's really more of a salmon or a coral color. This is a linen that I bought online. Um, I don't expect that, you know, just because the price I paid for it and where I bought it, I don't expect it to be super high quality, but it was very inexpensive. And so this will be my muslin, which will hopefully be a wearable muslin um, and kind of maybe like a summer suit. And then I have this beautiful wool from Burnley and Trowbridge, which is my favorite online fabric supplier, which will be um, the real, the real deal. So let's get started. When using a printable E pattern, I use a paper cutter to cut the pieces, the pieces of paper. It makes uh, for a more even uh, and straighter edge this way. I've also learned that if you plan ahead, you can save yourself some trouble by strategically cutting edges and not cutting all of the, the slices of paper. So if my grid is five pieces across, I can only cut the sides off of two and four. For all the consecutive rows, I would have to cut the top edges off, but then again, only the sides for pieces that line up with two and four. I also use double-sided tape. I think it makes it easier and I get a nice flatter um, assembly. All right, hey everybody. I look gross, I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to update you. I've got the uh, pattern assembled for the skirt and the belt. I haven't done the jacket yet. I'm really, I'm gonna, build the skirt first because then I have to assemble these pattern pieces which is um, I think it's 50 sheets and I just do not have the mental strength to do that right now so I um, am not very good at vlogging and I already made the skirt which I well the toile of the skirt and um, it is on the dress form. It went together pretty easily and fits. So I'm gonna leave that like pattern kind of as is. Um, the jacket I'm worried about, I did cut it a size bigger than the skirt because along the way and so now I find myself needing to go back to school so that's what I'm doing um it's hard <laughs> I also am married and have three kids so like it's I mean they're older my youngest is 13 but it's still it's still tricky um to to find balance sometimes I'm just uber stressed and cannot handle any more things um but my handle, Saucy Seamstress, actually came from work. A friend of mine who was my boss at the time, um, like, it was one of those things where we were um, ordering new name tags. And um, my co worker, she, uh, she has, like, she's very beautiful and she has this, like, striking white hair. And it's natural. It's not like man-made. Yeah, it's natural. Well, woman made girls have her head. But um so 
like some guests came in from an, the site that our museum has like multiple um, locations and sites and they came into one of our museums and asked who that delightful woman was with the white hair and so <laughs> Um, so, you know, we were getting these name tags made with our name and our, our title, and so her title on these new name tags was That Delightful Woman. <laughs> and so, um, for me, she had one made with my name and my title being um, Saucy Seamstress. So, that's where that came from, and I guess it's because I sew and I have bad attitude. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like, in the office, we decided that if we were the Golden Girls, that I would be Sophia, so, there you go. Um, yeah, so that's where Saucy Seamstress came from, and then it wasn't until it was, like, a little bit later that, um, an acquaintance, like somebody I knew was like, I was watching this documentary and they were talking about um, prostitution and how seamstress was often like a euphemism for prostitute or like they would like be a prostitute but the cover was that they were a seamstress. I also know that seamstress is not like the highly skilled um, <laughs> person, like I wish it should be like the saucy mantua maker but that's too long. So I'll keep the saucy seamstress. I am not a prostitute, just FYI. So like, I also feel awkward in front of the camera. I like did some photography work for a while. Um, you know, my husband was in school to like bring in a little extra money. And by a little extra money, I mean a little extra money. Um, so anyway, I'm much happier being behind the scenes, um, but it's good to try new things. It's good to try new things and get out of your comfort zone, and that's what I'm trying to do. So now to the big pieces, and I think I bought eight yards of this, and it looks like it's going to be plenty, so that makes me feel better. Because I also only bought eight yards of the wool. That's going to be the real, the real deal. So that's good. That's good. That's good. So I have three kids. Um, they're all big and they're getting old, and that makes me also feel old. Um, my oldest is 19. My middle child is 15 and my youngest is 13. So my areas of focus, um, like if I was just left to my own devices and the things that I would study, the historic fashion and well, not necessarily fashion. I don't really care about trends or designers. Well, I do care about trends, um, but I don't really care about designers. So like I, my focus is historic clothing, I should say. Um, My feelings are like, unless you're doing like some sort of like cosplay kind of thing, you know, and that's cool. Like that's not my bag, but I love seeing what people create. Um, but unless you're doing that, like clothes, like historic clothing, shouldn't like it's gonna look weird. It's gonna look out of place, but it shouldn't look like a costume. It should look like clothing. If that makes sense. So that's like my philosophy to like try to be as historically accurate as possible is to not look like I'm wearing a Halloween costume. Even though like my Halloween costumes are usually historic costumes because I'm also kind of lazy.
and I'm ready to start assembling sort of and I was having some trouble understanding what the instructions were trying to tell me because sometimes I'm a little bit like that and so um, I jumped onto a Wearing History's blog to see if she had any like updates or anything that I had missed and lo and behold there's a sew along so thanks for that Wearing History yay um, <clears throat> One thing it did say, which I did not do, so it's like you need to mark your pattern. I know I did like cut my notches and I did like make markings. Um, I was like, mark them with thread so that you see them on the other side. And so I am going to do that thing right now <clears throat> so that when I get to like, especially to like these finishing bits, like the buttons, that I'm not like, oh no. So, here I go. Hey guys, um, I'm just walking around with this here camera in my hand, not getting very good shots, but oh hey, there's my kimono. So let me tell you about this kimono real quick. I'm totally, hmm, squirrel. Um, I bought this at a vintage shop a while ago and it was like 1940s kimono and I was like, yeah, cool. And I just really loved it because I thought it was beautiful and the stitching and the dragon and I love him very much. And then I hung it on my wall. Last week, I was in Virginia Beach and I went to an antique shop that had the same exact kimono and I was like, doesn't make me love it any less. I still love him, but I was just very shocked and surprised. Anyway, kimono, nice backdrop. Um, so this jacket is tricky. Um, which is like kind of threw me off because the skirt went together so easily. It was like, I was waiting for something to have been done wrong or go wrong because it was so simple. And so this jacket, I cannot figure out how to put the facing in if you have the plain collar. So. I'm going to have to sew some pieces back on to the center front so that I can do the regular collar because then I can totally see how it all works then. Um, and maybe I'm just making this too hard on myself, I'm not sure. And, but I'm going to sew these pieces on and cut it so that it's the right shape and then sew the facing in. I should sew the pockets on first. So the pockets on, then the facing, um, and then I'll work on the collar. Now, <sighs> oh, the reason why like the piecing underneath or you know at the center front is gonna work is because that will be flipped over. It'll be the underside of the collar, and so it'll be fine. No, I don't know. I'm really nervous about this, like. I had high hopes that it would be like a quick build. And I think once I figure out how it goes together, it will be a quick build. Um, but right now, I'm like, I'm kind of scared, kind of scared about it. Because like I, not only do I have to make it again in the wool, but I also bought this hat for like fairly cheap. And it's from, it's period, it's fine, but it's like, it's kind of red. I like, can you see? You can't see very well, but it's like mushed. And I'm gonna have to replace the feathers, which is like the least of my concerns, but it's like all this. I'm gonna try to reblock it and hope that it, hope that it doesn't fall apart. Um, I think that's supposed to be up like that. No, I think I'm gonna leave it, but we'll see. But it's, it's kind of a mess. So I guess I'm gonna get back to it and do all those things. Um, see my mess? This is what happens like when my sewing room is also my home office and I study in here and I sew and apparently also eat. You see that? Gosh. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to work um, and I'll check in later. Okay. So I've been working all day, haven't even really gotten dressed, looking pretty scuzzy. Um, 
So I went to bed last night and I could not figure out how the facing went on the collar, got up this morning and realized it was because I had cut an extra piece and was making things harder for myself. I couldn't figure out how it all went together. So after I had like figured it out, it went together pretty smoothly. I've got the pockets on, I have the sleeves sewn. There's just a whole bunch of like hand finishing that I have to do before I sew the sleeves on and I'm gonna hem the jacket um, before I put the sleeves on and then it'll be done. Um, I have the belt made. I need to sew like buttonholes and stuff. So it's just like a lot of like handwork that I have to do now. Um, the thing is, I think it's too big, um, the jacket. So that is a good thing to know. I think I'm just gonna take it down one size um, when I cut it from my wool and cross my fingers, so. There you go, that's it. Okay, so I've got my mock-up done. Skirt fits, jacket's a little big, so I'm gonna use one size smaller on the pattern on the blue fabric. Um, but this is so big, like I might be able to just like, So I'm about to start cutting on this beautiful wool um, from Burnley and Trowbridge. They just have, they just carry good stuff and I love them a lot. Um, anyway, so I'm going to start cutting this and yeah, that's where we are. So this, I'm actually going to work in reverse. I made the skirt first before because it's so simple. I'm actually going to make that last and do the coat. Everything is still fresh in my mind that I need to do and adjust. And 